Hey there guys, welcome back, I'm Matt on the Sandbox channel and this time I'm going to be taking this Molnir launcher launching a Molnir satellite into a Molnir orbit Yeah, the Russians weren't crazy inventive with the names about this period in 1964 So let's just... let's just let them go with it, I mean this, this basis of launcher has been around for 50 years the satellites are still operational after 50 years, and the orbit is still used by Northern Hemisphere, Southern Hemisphere communication satellites after 50 years. So they must have known they were doing something right. This is a pretty standard launch for me, you've seen it a few times in the series. Um, I've been playing around with the Russian star a bit, I got some great advice last time, and I promise, I swear to the old gods and the new gods that I got it working. But as you're about to see in this video, the, the stars didn't go great this time, but, you know, more often than not I survived, which is good. Um, just never when I was filming it, so you're getting what you're getting, pretty much, with that. But the actual orbit ascent is very clear. I, I love this setup. It's, it's very much just kind of fire and forget. It tilts over without too much problems with the aerodynamic model I've got installed now. So yeah, I'm quite happy with this. It's just when the fuel cuts out here that you need to start worrying. The tactic I was told was to throttle down a little bit so you've still got some propulsion left in the engines. And then you jettison it away with a sideways thrust so that they move up and away from the vehicle. Well, let's see how that goes. Yeah, that that's how that goes. But like I say, it worked in practice, so let's have another go. This time what I've done is I've added some upward-facing uh, Ulage engines to try and sort it out. But I'm getting a bit of a wobble because those those are on the side of the vehicle and they're interacting with the aerodynamics to create a bit of a wobble. So I'm just going to try and manage that before I separate. So here we go. And, well... That's what's supposed to happen, I guess. Oh dear. Yeah, I mean... I mean, it worked. It worked, didn't it? I mean, you can see that it worked. I'm still flying, and they're kind of starring about a bit at the side. But now I've got a wobble on, and I don't know what I can really do about that. Just, I... That's why I decided to keep this one in the final cut of the video. It turned out that that was actually the best one of the ones I was recording, so I went with it. So yeah, what is this Molnir orbit that I'm going to launch into? Well, first of all, it's not an equatorial orbit. It needs to be at quite an angle. And the angle of attack is normally about 60 degrees or something. They're about 63.4, it says here. I've got written down my notepad. And the reason for that is that it allows you to put three into the system, uh, like e equilateral angles. Um, and they will provide constant coverage of a hemisphere. So well, here we go, we're separating that stage away now. And we're on to the upper stage. It's it's a, such a heavy satellite. I mean, it's an absolute dog to manage. But this one is quite realistic. If you look at photos of what the real Molnir satellite looks like, it's there, you know? And as you can see, I'm setting it up for the communication and things like that. So the hallmark of a Molnir orbit is that it's highly eccentric. You have basically just skimming the atmosphere at the low point, and at the top point it's almost beyond equatorial distance. But what this means is that in a, let's see, well, how long is an orbit? An orbit is about, you know, 11, 12 hours for a Molnir orbit in Earth's phraseology, in, you know, in Kerbal, everything's scaled down, but... In Earth, it's about 12 hours, and from 2 hours to 10 hours of that orbit, you're in full communication the whole time with the Northern Hemisphere, which is amazing for a country like Russia, the, I mean, even the United States, Southern Hemisphere countries like Australia, Brazil, you know, they could really go with that. And I'm going to show you, when I get it all set up nicely, exactly how that works, I mean, what it looks like in Kerbal. But with Kerbal Space Program, the thing is, you know... The KSE is on the horizon, so I'm not going to be using this for my playthroughs, but I thought it would be nice to show you just, just basically one of the different variations. And it's, a, like I said at the beginning of the video, it's a really withstanding kind of operation. The Molnir satellite, um, which means lightning, so it was the lightning launcher, the lightning orbit, and the lightning satellite, uh, was a military communications satellite. Um, 
to provide basically missile defense coverage um, or early warning from the NORAD incoming missiles over Canada. Um, so yeah, it was launched in 1965, but since 1967 they've been used by the Orbiter Television Company and they've been providing uh, trans-Russian communications. So they're only used three. Um, they only need three. They have um, many more up there in Molnir orbits now. But you only need three to have complete coverage for the entire Northern Hemisphere, which is amazing. They have to be timed a little differently, of course, and things like that. They can't all be cresting at the same point, and the spacing is a little weird. But you have to remember that they drift. Um, they do drift around the planet, so they're not, uh, like, geosynchronous or geostationary. I'm not sure if there's a term for geostationary above the equator, because I know it's impossible. Uh, but they're not kind of, like stationary in an altitude, if that makes sense. I, I, I don't even think it does. What I'm trying to say is it's not equatorial and it's not polar and it's not staying over one point. The Earth will progress underneath it, is what I'm trying to say. So yeah, there's, I mean, it's, it's incredibly highly classified, of course, because it's still military technology from the 60s and that kind of stuff never gets declassified. But what I'm going to use this for is a lunar mission that I'm planning. Um, it's called uh, Zond 5, which was the real universe name for it. Mine's Cond, but, you know, it sounds like some kind of Superman enemy. And I realize that I put no RCS on this, so it's moving like a dog again. It's two heavy fuel tanks. And I picked two fuel tanks to get the coloring right. I could have gone for, you know, empty tanks, but... This is this is what you do, isn't it? And I'm just doing the burn now to try and get myself not to burn up on the way round. Because I've still got the kind of issue with um, having to get it all fixed before I go away from the space center because of the, the remote tech mod. And since then, I'm, I've I've gone through deorbiting the the satellites in the previous video because I'm not going to be using them. Um, I'm going to build up a whole network from scratch um, at about the 300, 300 meter three hundred thousand meter mark. Um, maybe in a triangle, maybe in a square. I'm not quite decided yet. But anyway, there's still some parts on here from the FASA mod. This was recorded before I scrapped that which is where the RCS at the top's coming from. It's got like an Agena stage to try and set bulk it out a bit at the front where you can see the antenna. But yeah, that's that's my that's my Molnir orbit basically. And as you zip over, it means that you need you do need a long range antenna. You can't use quite a short range ground based antenna. You need to have a long range antenna on the satellite because at the peak, you could be an incredible distance from the planet, so you need one that can do that. And you also need on the ground, you need a tracking station that can cope with a variation in speeds across the sky. Because when they get down to the ground, they are moving really fast um, as they come in. It's like a comet, as it gets closer to the sun, it goes faster. Well, it's like any orbit in that respect, so... But this is a really, really bad example of a Molnir orbit, but I'm just hoping it can demonstrate that when you're close, you zip round. When you're on top, you take a long time to get round, and while you're there, you have full orbital coverage, which is completely different to the Telstar I launched last time, which is everywhere has a universally bad distribution of footage. So let's go to our next launch. This is the one I was telling you about. This is the Zond mission, and I'm, I cut out the beginning of it because it only really gets exciting when you're launching one of these now when we're about to do the Russian star, so... Fuel's almost out. Throttle back a bit. Oh, it's already cut out. Oopsie. But we're alive, and most importantly, all of the little Kerbin wildlife that is inside the probe is still alive. In real life, the Russians took up just such the most random crap. I think the most most impressive thing was that they took up tortoises, uh, flies, worms, plant seeds, bacteria, 
um, just random things, but they took up a variation because they, what they wanted to see was whether different kinds of life would be able to get through the radiation around the moon and back. Because remember they had detected different, the, the, the Van Allen belts, they detected um, incredible solar radiation around the, the moon where it was a massive problem um, that we don't have on Earth because of the atmosphere. They didn't know anything about that before they sent up probes. And they didn't know about the impact it would have on living beings during that kind of duration around the moon. So that's that's why they did it. You don't know until you do it. And it's better to do it on tortoises than on people. So the Soyuz here is... It doesn't have a... It is not, doesn't look like a traditional Soyuz because it doesn't have the bulbous section on the front because it didn't need a orbital section. It just put everything in the re-entry section with enough food to survive and sent it around the moon and back. So it's it's a pretty typical flight to the moon. You just point at the moon when you launch and you have to launch when it's just cresting the horizon and you will get there. You will get there. You have to check on your map occasionally but if you just go through with a burn, you'll get there. And for me, this Molnir rocket is incredibly dependable now, so I'm going to be using this to launch my geostationary satellites. Even if it's an American basis for a satellite like Syncom, I'm going to be launching them on the Molnir, because that's what I know and that's what I can, I can pretty much do. Although it does take a massive risk with the Russian star. And so here we are now, we're up to the last stage, the upper stage. And in real life, the this Zond was launched on a Proton rocket, which was uh, cargo rated, it wasn't crew rated. Uh, because that was fine for turtles. Like, turtles? Turtles? Turtles or tortoises? Make your mind up. Tortoises. So yeah, this happened in 1968. Um, it got within 2,000 kilometers of the moon. It took photographs as well of the Earth when it was far away. It was doing the kind of first, first you know, Earth rise kind of pictures, which was impressive. Okay, so here we go. I'm just going to jettison this stage because I kind of want it to burn up. So I'm just going to make sure that it's not getting close to 70,000 before I get rid of it. Yeah, it should be okay because I'm pretty much only at 100,000 myself. So there we go. Let's speed things up. You've seen this before. Just arranging the solar panels. And there we go. This is kind of like our Soyuz, but it obviously misses the big ball at the front. It does look exactly like the Zond. So there we go, we're just using the engines on the actual vehicle to get there. And all we want to do is get there and come back. Maybe we can even do it all in one burn if we organise it now. I'm not quite so sure that's going to be possible though because of where the moon will be. Oh well. There we go. I had to burn a little bit away from it, but there we go. So yeah, it got there, it did the whole thing. <coughs> Sorry. It did the whole thing. In just a few days, the mission time was, what was it, it was from 15th of September to 22nd of September, so it was a week. Which is an incredibly long time for a lunar mission, it's normally about three days there and back, so it skipped out on a day. The reason for that was that the re-entry didn't go to plan, the, it was a guidance failure, so it couldn't do a skip and slow down enough. It, it crashed down pretty hard. It wasn't what they expected, but it was picked up by a ship because it was expected to do for a a, um, a ground-based landing like the Russians had practiced and were used to. So here we go. This is us coming in for now uh, for our re-entry, and this is going to be the basis for all kind of future Soyuz things. When the center section dips away the orbital section would drop away at the same time and just leave it. And I'm going to burn off any extra fuel I've got now just to, to bring us in and make sure that we do come in. And it was incredibly successful. The The Russian tortoises and everything survived. Uh, the, the Soviet government said that the tortoises had lost 10% of their body weight, but they were fine. They were, you know, they were chirpy little guys when they got back. But yeah, it, it proved that 
these living things could go to the moon, and if the Russians didn't do that, then further steps would have been impossible. So, if you're watching it coming now, remember to stay tuned to this channel. You can subscribe to get my many new series that are coming out. I'm planning on doing quite a few new games in the next week or two. Uh, one you've already seen, Crusader Kings 2, but I'm also planning on doing ones that are going to be a bit of a surprise for everybody. Hey guys, if you like the video, remember to like and subscribe so you can help out the channel, and you can also get my newest videos whenever they're submitted. And if you like these amazing people, you can head over to Patreon, and you can help on my channel from as little as one oozed per video. And you can set monthly spending limits so it's never a problem. Thanks guys, see you later.